I'd like to invite um, Nicola Ranger um, uh, to take over as the moderator of the session. She'll be introducing the speakers. In person, we have two other speakers, uh, Anders and Benedict. And online, we have a few others. So Nicola, are you online? Can you hear us? Wonderful. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone, or, or nearly good evening and, and good morning to those in other parts of the world. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. So we, in this session, we're going to talk about integrating risk into the financial system and practitioners' perspectives on that. For, for those that joined a, another session earlier, just before this, we were looking at the scientific perspectives on that and the role of a, a new initiative called the Global Resilience Index Initiative. But now we're going to hear from people that do this as their day jobs, um, integrating risk into financial decision making or integrating climate and disaster risk uh, specifically. I'll just give a, a little bit of a, a recap um, to start us off before, before I introduce um, our excellent speakers today. So um, this will be a very brief recap for those that um, attended the session earlier and for our new, new people, um, an introduction of why, why this is important. So why, why should we care about um, the financial system and integrating risk into the financial system? So I'm aware that a lot of the understanding risk community will be used to working you know, in country on disaster risk management and climate adaptation or, or from a scientific perspective. So why should we care about finance? And the, the key issue there is that the decisions that are made um, by within the financial sector every day about investing in uh, infrastructure or um, lending to the agricultural sector or you know, investing in flood defences, all of these decisions that are made every day um, are having a big impact on risk and resilience, um, both for those companies themselves, but also for the wider society. So it's absolutely essential that we start to bring risk into decision making um, much more strongly. Uh, we know that at the moment, a lot of um, financial decisions are, are not fully bringing in um, finance, uh, climate and environmental risk information. So, for example, Mark Carney, uh, former governor of the Central Bank in the UK, the Bank of England, talked about the tragedy of the horizon. So the fact that people see these risks as long term in the financial sector, so we're not necessarily bringing them in to decision making today. But, you know, in the understanding risk community, we know that that horizon is actually already here, that the risks are real now. These are real risks, both to communities, economies and also the financial sector itself. So we're going to talk here today about how we can bring risk into that risk thinking into the financial sector so that we can make sure that the decisions that are being made today, both on the public side and the private side, um, are reflecting that risk and you know, critically not um, you know, help, helping communities to build resilience and helping communities, uh, economies to become more resilient, but also avoiding in locking in uh, risks for the long term. So we're going to hear from initially um, uh, Rowan Douglas, who I int introduce fully in a moment, and then we're going to move on to a panel of, of excellent speakers, both uh, in the room in Singapore and online. Um, practitioners across um, the public sector and the private sector. But I'm going to go first to Rowan and, and introduce you now. So, so Rowan Douglas, who is Head of Climate and Resilience Hub at Willis Towers Watson. Um, you have been working for many, many years um, in trying to bring risk thinking into the financial sector. And I'd like to welcome you to give some initial starting reflections, particularly from um, what you've learned from working in the insurance industry over many years, and also your, your you know, excellent work now at Willis. So I'll, I'll, over to you first, Rowan. Oh, well, thanks so much, Nicola, and uh, really uh, great to be with everyone this morning. And uh, as I was saying in there, we, this is a, we were both in the session on the GRI a few minutes ago, and uh, really lovely to be part of... Uh, uh, you are Asia um, and uh, was lucky enough to be part of the first understanding risk meeting in Washington DC back in 2010 uh, where many of us uh, uh, who are here on this uh, uh, event in, uh, in Asia online were, were there and it's great to see this community um, flourishing over those 10 years and, and ha has made such a, a difference and I think really what the story is and if it's a keynote theme I'm going to touch on in the next uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, it's that the particular skills and expertise and experience that's been 
um, generated by the, the understanding risk community over the last 10 years and all the organizations and initiatives uh, which sort of uh, it represents uh, through its sort of community around the world. This sort of very specialist knowledge, which is so valuable, but perhaps, but, but perhaps for too long has been um, uh, sort of not, not adopted and taken up by the wider sort of economy, public and private system. I think we're on the cusp of, of that uh, transformation. And obviously that'll be great for, uh, for the influence that this uh, you know, community has, but also particularly as, uh, as Nicholas said, um, for the protection of lives and livelihoods and, uh, and well-being against uh, you know, growing climate and other risks. And today's session is really about how, um, how the financial system, public, but particularly in this case, private, can be a key channel of um, influence and, and positive impact. And um, uh, that's really the, the theme I wanted to, to, to address. Uh, some of us, uh, including Nicola, we were lucky enough to be uh, in Glasgow uh, uh, this time last month uh, to participate in, in COP26. I'm sure a number of um, uh, the, U, you know, the, the viewers uh, in the UR community were there too. And uh, you, don't know, you don't need to have been there to have sort of picked up, you know, many of the key themes. And beyond the general sort of international politics of, of mitigation, uh, and people's net zero uh, commitments and the future of coal uh, and all the rest. What really came through, and it was expected, but it really did um, uh, fulfill its uh, uh, sort of uh, billing, was that um, the, the finance and business uh, community and uh, related markets and their integration into this agenda uh, was full square in a way that had not been at a COP before. And that was due to many factors, uh, not least the leadership, I must say, of, of Mark Carney, who we're lucky enough to have as patron of the Global Resilience Initiative, uh, Index Initiative. But, um, and those who had been to a few COPs before, and I've been to one or two, that was really sort of significant. And um, if Paris, if you like, is known for the politics, the moment where the world's 200 countries basically recognized uh, a grand collective challenge and a, a requirement to move in a new direction. We may argue whether we're moving quickly enough, but basically when you say Paris, you immediately think of those 200 countries moving uh, in a sort of a agreeing to move somewhere else. Really, I think in 10 years time, when we say Glasgow, uh, the sort of, it will symbolize the fact that mainstream markets and business decided to move in, in another direction. Uh, the second, um, theme that really came through was the importance of resilience and adaptation and some related areas of, of, of loss and damage. But I think for those of us who have been to a number of COPs, again, it was the first time that resilience and adaptation was really seen as um, uh, an equal uh, and, a, and a growing uh, sort of uh, um, necessity and not really a false choice between mitigation and adaptation. And for those of us in the UR community, that's a huge uh, change and a very positive one. And the final one was the urgency. Uh, the, the, the sense of urgency to deal with not what's now been classed as the climate emergency, not the um, uh, not climate change so much. That that was the other key things. So, if you like, you are Asia. It's the first big event after COP uh, that will sort of benefit from that uh, from that tailwind. So, I'll, I'll turn now, I suppose, to four or five very quick themes, which I know will probably be, be picked up by the great lineup of speakers we've got. The first is um, in Glasgow, we were in the home of Adam Smith, or at least the academic home of Adam Smith, where uh, he was professor of uh, um, uh, moral philosophy and, uh, and economics at Glasgow University. And as many of you all know, he wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations, as well as uh, uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in it, he basically was the, the grandfather of modern economics, as, as most are in the on the uh, on the call will know and in a sense he provided the intellectual foundations that really have decided you know frankly who prospers who doesn't prosper what gets built what doesn't get built uh, literally um, the economic underpinnings of what's led to a global population of eight billion people and he described how the invisible hand of economics uh, drives uh, much of that uh, real world um, 
uh, development and uh, 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 prosperity or not of populations. And I think really a developing theme uh, at Glasgow was how the invisible hand of Adam Smith needs to be retrained to take account of, if you like, the new risks of uh, the, uh, the world that we face now that perhaps weren't as prescient in uh, the 1770s uh, when he wrote the book. Session is retraining the invisible hand of economics so that almost automatically we build uh, a society in the future which is more resilient because it's economically rational to do so. It's also morally uh, rational uh, to do so. And through that, we will save millions of lives and livelihoods and billions uh, of dollars of um, assets and, and development gains in the years and decades ahead. And that's a structural change which will be um, uh, fulfilled by ultimately the uh, integration of the right data into financial decision making. And uh, I think Nicola has, has coined a term of the data emergency. So we have a climate emergency, but we also have a data emergency. And we have, we have two pandemics, at least at the moment. We have the pandemic of COVID, which we can see uh, and uh, feel around us all the time, tragically. But we also have a global pandemic of climate fragility and it's even more if you like pervasive and perhaps obviously will be ultimately more significant and we have to cure uh, that pandemic of uh of fragility and it's through the right data getting into the right decision making particularly around capital and legal duties which will be the, the key to that and really that's what uh, uh this uh, this work is all about and we'll hear more about it in a, in a few minutes from the other speakers I would say we've done this before. Um, if we were having this uh, call uh, 150 years ago in 1871, it would be uh, 100. It would be two months after the Great Chicago Fire, which destroyed uh, over three square miles of Chicago uh, and basically led that city to uh, uh, almost ruin. It had another fire three or four years later, so it was wiped out. And it wasn't the only city being wiped out at the time across North America and Europe. Um, many cities, as they grew and became more industrial, were, uh, were destroyed by fire. And it was like the climate change issue of the time. It had gone on for, for decades. And ultimately, um, investors could no longer cope. And they went to a weak Washington in the 1870s after the Civil War 10 years earlier and said, we can't go on like this. And um, they sort of basically pulled the alarm cord and said, we need, we need insurance for our investments. So um, they talked to some insurers who did their data analysis to figure out how a sustainable risk pool could be created for uh, urban cities uh, in the US and ultimately beyond. And uh, the investor said, well, that's great. We'll just buy insurance. And the insurer said, well, no, no, no. Can't do that unless we have uh, building, zone, uh, building codes and zoning laws and fire departments every, every couple of miles. And we require policyholders to behave in certain ways. And that was to create a sustainable uh, risk pool, which allowed uh, insurers to be sustainable, which was ultimately the community, which allowed investment to, to flow. And ironically, 50, over 50 years, the shape of cities was changed through the specific rules of insurance contracts, which then informed uh, investment and development decision-making, such that by the 1920s, outside of warfare, urban conflagration, which has been the scourge, scourge of humanity uh, since basically the dawn of civilization was effectively um, extinguished. And most of us who would have grown up in those cities would not have known how the invisible hand was shaping a resilient future to protect basic human rights of life, livelihood and shelter. And we all have to relearn those lessons and apply them in a bigger but more modern way when it comes to, to climate and related uh, natural hazards. So um, I, think I've, I think I've set, Nicola, if I may, uh, the, key, uh, the key themes, I suppose. The final thing I'd say, and it picks up on the, the issue of, of urgency, and many of us who have been in this domain for a while, uh, it almost becomes business as usual. But um, we now, particularly those of us in this field, have to break down our own silos. 
There's so many initiatives and we all fight for uh, our own survival, uh, whether it's economically or in terms of awareness. But we must cure this data and knowledge challenge into mainstream markets, taking advantage of big developments uh, that are being driven by reforms of financial regulation in Singapore, uh, here in London, where I'm speaking from, but right around the world. The, the mainstream financial markets are craving for the incorporation of physical uh, climate risks, essentially geography into economics. And we in this community have a duty to fulfill and, uh, that demand, because if we don't, there is no one else. And uh, so uh, it's action stations. Uh, Nicola, uh, back to you, but really thrilled that um, this theme has been given such a, a focus here at UR and uh, such a great uh, a lineup to, uh, to talk about the, the practitioner side of getting this done. Back, back to you, Nicola. Thank you so much, Rowan, for those uh, in inspiring words. And as I said, I know you've, you've been leading this charge for a long time in bringing risk into financial decision making. So thank you for those uh, opening comments. So, so now um, we're going to progress with our, our five uh, excellent uh, practitioners who, who do this on a day to day basis. Um, I will uh, introduce you and, and then I'll come back and, and we can begin the discussion. So first, first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce um, Professor uh, Ila Patnak. I'm, I apologize for pronouncing that. Uh, incorrectly elevates. Um, so she is a professor of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy uh, in India. Uh, then we'll hear from Calvin Quek, who is a senior environmental specialist at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So, so we'll begin with a very much a focus on infrastructure. And then over to the, the live room in, in Singapore to Anders Nordheim, who's senior vice president of the Asia Sustainable Finance at the WWF. And then to prof Professor, sorry, Benedict, uh, <laughs> Benedict Signer, for, who's program coordinator and senior financial specialist for the World Bank. Definitely should be a professor if you're not already. And then finally to Connor Donaldson, who is chief executive officer at the, the Global Asia Inf uh, Insurance Partnership. So firstly to you, um, Ila, if, if I may. So in, in your role um, uh, in in India, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your reflections on what role governments play in ensuring that risk is integrated into um, thinking in um, finance and investment decision making? Um, and can you talk about your work on, on resilient infrastructure in particular? Thank you, Nicola. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I want to talk about the way we've been thinking, and I must say that it's recent thinking in the government in India and in government circles and in the community in India, that the government largely has two roles. One is directly financing infrastructure because uh, India is one of those countries where a bulk of the new infrastructure in the world actually is going to be built. Our infrastructure needs are huge. And it, for us, it's not so much about legacy infrastructure as it is about the new infrastructure that we built. And, you know, there is direct public money going into that. And governments have to take decisions about what infrastructure is to be built, where it is to be built, when it is to be built, how much money is to be put in and so on. So that's one pillar of the work that the government needs to do. But equally important is the government's work in terms of and its role in terms of incentivizing uh, resilient infrastructure. I mean, whether that incentivizing is done through certain norms, through information, uh, through, uh, so for example, if uh, one had uh, a requirement that projects have to be insured, and if we had ways of measuring uh, risk related to those projects and we had that information available, then the insurance sector would be looking at that information and would be pricing that risk. And that's how that would feed into uh, what you choose to build, what the private sector chooses to invest in. In terms of the private sector also, we actually have a, uh, in terms 
it's not just that equity goes in. A lot of, or, you know, direct equity of companies is not what is just going into building of infrastructure. There's a large amount of uh, debt that goes in, a lot of uh, mm, financial institutions money, like, you know, whether it's pension funds, whether it's foreign pension funds who are looking for uh, investing in countries where infrastructure is being built, who have long term time horizons, uh, even if it is for banks, which are actually not very well suited for uh, infrastructure investment because there is a maturity mismatch. But even if it is for banks, then we have a large number of public sector banks. And in fact, we've had periods when public sector banks have led to infrastructure and maybe that's been a source of trouble. But you know, if you think of the financial sector as a whole, then the financial sector needs the information that goes into their decision making about which projects to invest in, what kind of projects to invest in, whether they are resilient or not. And one of the decisions, uh, just as an example, is how much do you invest upfront? Because investing upfront brings down the life cycle cost of uh, maintaining the project or it makes uh, the life of the project longer. And those sort of, uh, you know, I guess the uh, kind of uh, session you had before this, which was on developing an index or that's the part that the technical guys can bring in. That's not the part that, you know, people like us, where those who work in either uh, public finances or who work in uh, the financial sector, we don't really have that expertise. So there has to be this um, coming together of the two kinds of expertise and of the uh, disaster uh, experts who have uh, knowledge of risk and understand that risk and get that using the government's incentive structures, stand, using standards, using uh, requirements such as uh, regulatory requirements about whether something is to be insured or not, pulling all that in into financial decision making because you want money to go to where uh, infrastructure is resilient. I mean, sometimes, I might even say that apart from building this uh, sort of uh, incentive mechanism, the government may have less of a role to play because directly putting money in by politicians is always risky. You know, uh, which politician would rather not have two bridges and, and have only one bridge over a river? Any politician would you know, given their time horizons, which are shorter than, let's say, the time horizons of a pension fund. Okay? You might actually prefer that the funding is coming from somebody who has longer time horizons. So the uh, private sector has a very big role to play in terms of, you know, where the money would flow in. But the government has a role to play in terms of creating that incentive structure in terms of actually thinking deeply about uh, how would we incentivize more resilient infrastructure. That's not something that's been happening too much of. And, you know, I was uh, very glad to hear Rowan, Rowan talk about how uh, Glasgow has changed that and that it might be a different world uh, from now on. And one would really like to see that because you see, in the space of uh, climate, uh, we have started seeing money flow into uh, sustainable finance, money flow into, uh, you know, some, some uh, manner of description of green or bonds. But in the space of uh, resilient infrastructure, as distinct from uh, the ones that create, uh, have a bigger carbon footprint. So it's, we haven't really seen this happening in this space. And I think there's a big information gap and that information gap needs to be filled. And it's communities like yours that need to work with uh, 
you know, people like us who work in the space of uh, public finance and government and regulation and incentives and bring that together and bring that information into daily use, into all decision making for uh, projects uh, and for infrastructure. Uh, so that's, that's uh, broadly my sense of where and what role governments and policymakers have to play. Uh, I'll take one more minute uh, for what is it that we have been doing uh, in India. Now, in India, we have a, a huge national infrastructure pipeline, which is about uh, $1.5 trillion to be spent in the next five years. Part of it coming from the central government, part from the state being implemented by the central government, state governments, and uh, a par partly by the private sector. And I would say that while thinking about this and implementing these, this is the time to bring in the kind of knowledge and information that uh, should uh, go in for resilient uh, projects. And, uh, you know, that, that's a new space in which we need to uh, move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ila. And I think you one point, well, you've made it uh, several important points, but one that really stood out for me was actually the role of pension funds, because certainly in, in the UK, we now, for the first time, our pensions funds are, are beginning to wake up to climate change because our government has uh, implemented various disclosure requirements on them for the first time concerning climate risks. So I spend a lot of time talking to pensions funds. So it's good, good to hear that they can play such an important role in longer term resilience. So now I'd like to, to move over to uh, Kelvin um, at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to hear a little bit more about the role of um, development banks in this space. Um, and particularly to, to learn to what, to what extent in your experience are these risks being incorporated into infrastructure investment in the region? Um, and, and a little bit about your work on promoting resilience. Thanks so much, Nicola. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. Um, with respect to climate risk, and um, let's focus uh, on physical effects, uh, the physical risk of climate change. Um, we actually see that uh, financing to address this type of risk is um, very low, according to uh, the recent um, multi-development bank, uh, joint multi-development bank report, uh, of which AIB was a, a, a contributor, uh, less than 15% of uh, climate finance uh, uh, was in the category of adaptation finance, whereas 85% was in mitigation finance. So, so financing um, infrastructure to, to be resilient um, is difficult, uh, is uh, much smaller than uh, the challenge that we are facing uh, with respect to, to climate change. Uh, and, and we all know the science, right? The difference between one degree scenario and a 1.5 degree scenario, you have a sort of a exponential uh, uh, increase in the, the uh, uh, likelihood of uh, extreme weather events. Um, uh, and if I could talk slightly a bit about the challenges as it relates to the financing adaptation, uh, the biggest barriers really have to do with um, uh, trying to find a way to uh, value the integration or the financing of these adaptation measures. Uh, um, typically adaptation measures, so trying to you know prevent a bridge uh, from being affected by climate change or a, a hot physical asset uh, which uh, my institution will focus on project financing. Uh, these things are seen as upfront costs and are not built in, typically built into the, into the, uh, into the return structure uh, for, over the lifetime of the asset. Uh, at the same time, the, the technicalities around adaptation finance uh, can be quite uh, complex. The specific uh, uh, design changes that uh, might be proposed might be of a ticket size that is not exactly within the sweet spot for banks such as the AIB. Uh, so uh, we are we we've done uh, quite a bit of mitigation finance, but our adaptation finance, as I mentioned, 
uh, as indicated by the, the, the broader pool of adaptation of, of climate finance is smaller than we hope. Uh, but it's something that we are, we, are, we are certainly working on. And the key thing is to try to find ways in which we can aggregate um, uh, these types of uh, adaptation programs uh, for a large, to, to, to put them to a larger scale. Um, AIB has uh, been talking uh, with the CCRI, uh, the Coalition for Climate uh, Resilient Infrastructure, of which I believe Phyllis Thomas Watson is a key partner, uh, looking at the methodologies there uh, to, uh, to, to identify a highly credible um, uh, transition um, uh, uh, pathways uh, to, uh, to address uh, um, uh, the physical address, the physical effects of climate change. Um, I, um, I, think the, I think the other challenge that I would just say uh, as, as an MDB um, that we face um, <clears throat> is that climate change is a risk that we need to mitigate and avoid and so forth. At the same time, uh, AIB is in the business of building infrastructure and uh, we are guided very much by the uh, principle of doing no harm. So as much as we want to build resilience in the infrastructure that we're financing, it's important that people are compensated properly uh, when we're moving people in the process of developing these assets, that, that uh, there are no instances of violence and so forth, that uh, forests are not destroyed and so forth. I think there's an important point to be noted that uh, uh, Mother Earth gave us nature-based infrastructure <laughs> that supports human life. <laughs> Uh, and, and here we are trying to build something uh, that would replace it in some ways to, to build potential, obviously, uh, uh, something that's important to connect people to reduce poverty and so forth. But we have to be very careful, certainly with uh, the increased awareness that, uh, the, of the, the biodiversity crisis that we're facing, that the hard infrastructure that we build uh, should not be at the expense of destroying the, the natural infrastructure that, uh, that has been done to us. So I'll start right there to, so the others uh, have more to more time to speak. Thank you very much, Kelvin. And that actually brings us on beautifully to uh, Anders, the mention of uh, nature-based solutions and, and natural infrastructure. But uh, Anders, I wonder if coming to you now, if, if you can also help help us of expand our view beyond infrastructure. And I, I know that WWF in the region has been doing a lot of work with banks and regulators and corporates. And if you could tell us a bit about that wider landscape and, and also you know, we focus a lot on climate, but, but maybe mentioning the importance of, of nature as well. Thanks very much, uh, <clears throat> Nicola, for uh, having me for this uh, panel. Yes, yeah, so we work with a lot of banks, investors and regulators around the uh, ASEAN region on um, integrating climate and nature risks into their um, operations, but also seeing the uh, opportunities that come out of it. And um, you know, we talked quite a bit about climate change and emissions here, and climate change and emissions destroys, but nature essentially enables and protects. And I think we sometimes maybe forget how important nature is. Nature underpins our existence and well-being, um, even economically, by some measures um, half the world's GDP is moderately or highly dependent on uh, nature. Um, there's different ways of measuring it, but certainly if you look at it, this from a supply chain point of view, every single product that we consume, whether it's you know water or uh, television screens, is somehow connected to nature. And when we destroy uh, and degrade nature, our ability to continue to benefit from it is compromised and in some ways destroyed. So it's very important to think about nature also and protecting nature when we think about environmental issues. And we're not very good stewards of nature. You know, deforestation is still rife in, in many areas, including in Southeast Asia. Uh, pollution is is happening in in the water systems and watersheds, and these are issues that um, that are critical for financial institutions to incorporate. Also, in addition to climate change, and I think what we also need to 
um, think about a little bit is the interaction between climate and nature. So if you look at a financial risk calculation, you might have sort of financial risk plus climate risk plus environmental risk and think that that is your risk calculation. But there is an interaction element between nature and between climate. We call it a multiplication factor if you want to, where um, destroying um, nature makes climate change worse and uh, increasing emissions has a negative effect on nature. So this element is very important for financial institutions to factor in and it's really great to see that there's tremendous momentum on the climate side. We need similar momentum on the nature side. And nature is a local um, issue, unlike in many ways climate change. So when we talk to financial institutions, uh, especially in this area, um, you know, we talk about nature from the point of view of what's happening in this region. How is nature being destroyed? Is it being maybe restored? What type of um, factors are polluting ecosystems? Is it uh, runoff from infrastructure? Is it agriculture? Is it, is it urbanization, for example? Those are elements that uh, need to be factored in by, uh, by the financial institutions. And I think when you um, put it in that context, it becomes quite easy for the financial institution participants to then see this because you know, we live in one of the most affected regions of the world when it comes to climate change and nature loss. So, you really need to just look out the window and you can see what's happening in the world. You know, if you live in, in Bangkok, you can see the, the pollution and the flooding and the, um, um, the destruction of, of, of areas, of agricultural areas around it. And, and you, you've, you, you know that this is going to have an impact on the quality and prosperity of, uh, of the people who live there and therefore also your um, assets and liabilities. So it's not a difficult conversation to have with these financial institutions, but the solutions are um, quite challenging in some cases. So if you look at something like, I mean, infrastructure was mentioned here, so I'll go with that theme. If you look at something like a hydroelectric power plant, um, you have a dam and this dam, uh, this dam's costs are affected by sedimentation. So you need to have some sort of sedimentation control in order to, um, uh, in order to manage that. Now sedimentation depends in many river systems, depends on what's happening around in the local ecosystems. So if there's rapid deforestation in the area, then that'll increase secondary sedimentation. But even if there isn't rapid deforestation in the area, climate change might destroy the forest anyway, uh, and therefore you're faced with the same problems. So some of the interesting conversations we can then start to have is around, for example, nature-based solutions. These are very new, these are very, um, I think, conceptually interesting, but we don't have really a huge amount of um, really successful examples to show to. Um, I, I live in, um, by the Ang Mo Kio Bishan Park here, here in Singapore and it's, there's a great example there of a nature-based solutions that I've put into place because there's, it's a flood area. So it used to be a um, engineered flooding um, area where you would have essentially a, a canal that was produced by concrete, you know, the kind of canals that you see on movies from, from LA. Um, but they completely transformed it to create a ecosystem that acts as a natural flood defense. And once they did that, because this was a completely green um, area, it, uh, you know, it manages the temperature, it attracts wildlife, it uh, increases also people's um, happiness in the area because you have a greener area. 
And that's, that's just a sort of example of a fantastic little, you know, micro nature-based solution that, um, that you can put in place if you think a little bit creatively. And you have other examples that you can think about, like mangroves and things like that. But, you know, those are some of the elements that we are starting to think about around um, infrastructure, nature-based solutions, and also connecting nature to these, these very much local issues. But um, I think we still have a long way to go in order to also make these practical and mainstream. Um, and that's where some of the challenges lie ahead. Thank you so much, Anders. And I think it's, as you say, it's 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 really positive right now to be seeing so much momentum, um, particularly in the financial sector around nature. And I'm sure, you, well, hopefully, you were equally as happy as I was at, at COP26 to see the commitments to uh, phase out um, 33 global financial institutions um, committing to phase out any investments that that are linked to deforestation. So that was a if, if somewhat too late, but, but, but still important step in that direction and good to see the work of um, things like the Task Force for Nature related financial disclosures as well, which will hopefully make a, a big difference. But now um, coming over to you, uh, Benedict, so back to the, the, the role of the public sector in this. So, so you've been working for uh, more than a decade, helping governments to build their um, fiscal financial resilience to disasters particularly in the region. Can you talk a little bit about how, how that type of work on, on, on the public financial risk management side links into creating incentives for wider societal resilience and, and talk about some of your work in the region? Sure, thank you, Nicola. And as you said, I guess it's a bit of a change in focus. My work is much more focused on not the investment side and the risk reduction, resilience, long-term planning side, but it's how governments can deal with climate shocks and disasters when they do happen, and specifically on the financial planning for that. So how can we make sure that money is there within the government and across society for better results, for better building back? And I think the question you ask about the, the link between government to society, to better outcomes, and how that is being enabled by or supported by finance and, and private markets is a super important one. Um, I would buckle it in three, um, three categories or three points, key points, examples on that. And, and the first is actually the link from finance to results. And especially when we look at disaster response, it's one thing to put in place a mechanism that can pay out, whether that's insurance, whether that's budget funds or budget mechanisms. It's a whole nother step to make sure that money actually reaches the right beneficiaries at the right time whether that's households, individuals, whether that's the Ministry of Transport to re rebuild roads, Ministry of Education to open up schools. Um, and often, unfortunately, we still see a, a focus which is too narrow on the finance side, but doesn't actually consider how the money flows through. So as one example, um, what's been very popular, very kind of hot topic over the last growing last decade is parametric insurance. For understandable reasons, it's relatively quick to set up. It's relatively easy to understand. It pays out on an index, right? You have a threshold, it pays out. What the problem is when that ignores the, what happens with the money after the payout, and we can see there are governments where um, well-meaning donors, partners, private sector, public sector put in place an instrument that triggers as intended, that pays out, but then the money gets stuck in the public financial management system of a government that it never flows through. So paying attention to the whole chain both of the money comes from and where it flows through, I think is super important. And linked to a, similar, a different example or approach to this is thinking about connecting the financial preparedness to the operational preparedness, not just how the money flows through the system, but what actually happens with the money. And so I, I think of that as shock responsive systems. And we had great examples in social protection, adaptive social protection, where the same safety net system scales up in response to shock. The same channels are used with more money flowing through it to reach the same people with additional support or more people. But right, that same thinking can equally apply to infrastructure, for example. Nicola, we worked on, on, on a, a, an approach to that, right? Looking at, well, how do you restore services? How can you say if you have an electricity system, you have main, normal maintenance requirements, how can you make those maintenance systems shock responsive that you can scale them up quickly with the same operational preparedness tied directly to the financial preparedness? The, my, my second point would be that it's 
super important to pay attention to building local capabilities and local systems within countries. Um, one example is embedding the financial risk management thinking within the government itself. So it's not an exogenous incentive to say, set up a financing mechanism and when something happens, you draw on that, but internalize it in fiscal planning. And so uh, making, assessing your contingent liabilities from disasters, putting a price tag on that, and making this part of your standard every year fiscal planning, budgeting, it flows through, not just for response, but actually puts the price tag on risk reduction and helps you assess, well, what's the value? Where should I put my money? Should I put my money on risk reduction? How much risk reduction makes sense? You can't reduce everything, right? And how much risk should you retain? Um, but equally around looking more on the market side, on insurance markets, for example, again, we've seen a, a really big growth in a focus on international solutions, international insurers, reinsurers, working with governments, working with development partners, World Bank, just as much, and, and brokers. Um, release has played a huge role, of course, in creating the momentum. But sometimes that's a bit too short-term focused in a sense, and, and we forget to pay attention about building the local insurance markets, long-term sustainable solutions, which doesn't lead to a quick transaction. But once they are established, they actually lead to those results that Rona set out at the beginning, same for, for urban fires, right? That's not an external transaction. It really has to come and grow in the local domestic economy. And the third point is actually what um, was said at the beginning. I would say think about incentives and take the long view on this. Because across all of this, government has to create the right incentives for the private sector, for markets to actually lead to better outcomes. And I would say that this retraining of the miserable hand, right, whether that's through regulation, whether it's through incentives, financial incentives or disclosure requirements, but equally on the demand side, I mean, in some case through compulsion, making insurance mandatory um, or tying insurance to um, utility bills, to building permits, building codes, whatever it might be, but creating those better structures. And again, those are not short-term solutions. They take a lot of patience and they take a lot of recognition that um, sometimes we just don't see the results very quickly. Uh, but we have to stick with it, especially from a donor side, from a development partner side, and that we have to invest in those long-term results with the very patient money, which may not lead to a direct return on investment in a short, in, in a short cycle, but kind of helps align this, what we heard at the beginning, this, this shorter political cycles, I guess, with the longer um, investment cycles required. Thank you. Thank you, Benedict. I think you have really uh, excellent points about the, the role of uh, public finance in, in reshaping the invisible hand and then the role of regulation. And I really like the point on that that long long term view and needing to stick with this and create the incentives for the long term, which I think leads us perfectly then on to Connor uh, on the role that insurance can play uh, specifically in this. And Benedict made the point on the importance of developing local insurance markets. I know this is something an area that you have a huge amount of expertise on. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? What is the role of insurance in embedding risk in wider financial decision making? I have to do my part and make sure that I take myself off mute. Uh, five, uh, five speakers and uh, get to the opportunity to come at the end. And um, with that, I get the opportunity also to say um, really great points that have been raised by my colleagues. Um, but you've asked a really excellent question, and um, as an insurance professional, um, conversations about risk and resilience are on the top of my mind and, and frankly, very close to my heart. Um, so what I, just responding to your question, maybe what I'd like to do is take a moment to share a, a personal anecdote of why um, the conversation around risk and resilience are so important to me. Um, and then uh, go on to a quick overview of why um, I'm so happy to be here in Singapore leading the Global Asia Insurance Partnership and then spend a, a little bit of time speaking about how our work, I hope, is going to contribute uh, to addressing the challenge that this panel has been focusing, focusing in on. Um, so I'm a Canadian by birth. Uh, I was born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, now many of you will be aware that BC has been in the weather news uh, quite frequently recently. Um, this summer, we had temperatures of nearly 50 degrees centigrade. Uh, we had devastating forest fires uh, with an entire small town uh, wiped out in an interface fire that lasted less than one hour. And now, um, more recently, 
Uh, we've experienced flooding so severe that Vancouver was cut off uh, by road from the rest of Canada and small towns uh, across British Columbia, uh, including the small town where my sister lives, Merritt, BC, uh, was so damaged uh, by the flooding that uh, it's very difficult to see uh, how they're going to be able to rebuild. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, the physical environment of where I grew up uh, is no longer characterized by four seasons and it really is uh, three F's and it's uh, freezing, fires and flooding. And uh, it really does put an incredible amount of pressure on individuals, on communities, uh, on the infrastructure that um, you know, really is uh, critically important to have uh, strong economies and resilient economies. So as I said, this issue um, and the discussion so far are really close to my heart. Um, and so um, I'm very fortunate to be in Singapore now and have this opportunity to lead an organization called uh, the Global Asia Insurance Partnership. Now, uh, GIP, uh, as we like to call it, uh, is a multi-stakeholder partnership, uh, bringing together regulators, uh, the insurance sector, uh, and academia. And the focus of GIP is to work across uh, a three-pillar structure um, to look at um, resilience to large-scale systemic risks uh, and new emerging and accelerating risks in Asia. Uh, so we have a component, our first pillar, uh, which is really about doing innovative research and supporting uh, the development of tools, um, risk management tools. Uh, our second pillar is a policy think tank, which is about engaging with regulators and policymakers about uh, topics that are critically important in terms of supporting uh, uh, a strong insurance sector, uh, but also hopefully contributing to broader uh, resilience. Um, and lastly, um, the third pillar uh, being about supporting talent development, uh, working with uh, academia, uh, as well as other partners in the capacity building space to really strengthen uh, the availability of um, uh, training um, to help them hopefully uh, prepare for the next generation of challenges facing the insurance sector. Um, so GIP across these three pillars, um, we've identified two thematic focus areas for our organization. So the first one is on climate risk, um, which uh, I think um, is probably why I was invited to speak today. Uh, and then the second one is looking at um, pandemics. Um, so I'll spend uh, just a couple of moments speaking about uh, the work that we've been doing on the climate risk side. Um, so we've, um, of course, looked at um, really the proliferation of different groups and entities that are out there working in this space. And, you know, it's clear that there's a lot of um, attention being paid to how um, financial system, uh, broadly speaking, as well as the insurance sector, um, can support a, a transition to net zero and um, ensure greater resilience. And, I think here uh, we've recognized that uh, we've got an opportunity to provide value, uh, recognizing our multi-stakeholder nature and the different voices that we have around the table uh, to focus in on supporting uh, broader awareness, risk awareness. Um, uh, one area uh, that we've been looking at uh, doing some work in is looking at sea level projections and understanding um, how um, uh, the risk profile is changing for urban centers across, uh, across Asia, but with a primary focus on uh, emerging Asia and recognizing the significance of the protection gap. And we think that work like this is going to be instrumental in terms of strengthening risk awareness uh, amongst policymakers as well as amongst individuals and businesses hopefully facilitating uh, conversations around what can be done to uh, um, help close the protection gap um, that frankly is uh, quite scary when you look at it and particularly uh, against a backdrop where we know that the physical environment around us is changing uh, so significantly uh, and so quickly. Uh, the second piece of work that um, you know, we're quite keenly looking at, and this is really speaking to um, you know, the important role that I think the insurance sector has to play in the transition. Um, insurance is risk protection is, of course, critical, but I really think that, um, and this is uh, a view that um, you know, I've shared with a number of colleagues uh, over the last little while, um, is that the risk analytics and the risk intelligence are going to become so much more crucial. Um, so one, we need to be able to have a better price uh, on climate risk, uh, an accurate price and one that takes into account uh, the ways in which uh, climate risk is going to manifest on the asset side, um, but I think also on the liability side. 
Um, I think that there's a lot of, um, I would coin the term uh, short termism when it comes to looking at general insurance and the role that it can play, um, particularly um, annual pricing cycles being what they are for most general insurance products. Um, that you know, prices continue to increase until the point where they can't increase anymore because there's no capacity to pay for it and at which point it becomes uninsurable. I think there, um, if we can do a better job in looking at uh, climate risk pricing on the liability front, you know, we can come a long way in terms of strengthening uh, that risk awareness and hopefully uh, with that being able to make sure that um, the right level of risk protection is there, um, that the important steps necessary um, on risk protection uh, and risk uh, prevention are taken, and that policymakers really are um, engaged in the conversation and recognizing the important role that the insurance sector has to play, not only on the protection side, but also in terms of, as I said, that risk analytics and the risk intelligence side. Um, so with these uh, different areas of work under the broad theme of climate risk, um, I'm really hopeful that uh, through our engagement um, and the work that we're doing, we're able to hopefully um, provide opportunities for the insurance sector to, um, to support greater resilience within the region, uh, bring policymakers and regulators into the conversation and work with them you know, collaboratively to understand what some of the challenges are in terms of being able to, um, um, uh, I would say, strengthen the insurance sector in a way that uh, one, of course, maintains the critical nature of policyholder protection at the forefront, but at the same time, um, hopefully uh, builds an enabling environment where the insurance sector can hopefully help to close some of these significant protection gaps that we see. So um, I'll stop there. I know I probably went on a little too long, but um, as I said, a topic that's so close to me as a professional, but also uh, at a personal level. So thanks, Nicola. Thank you so much, Connor. Well, I think we're so we're coming to the end. I want to give huge thanks to each of our speakers. But I, if if I may, before um, Benedict and Anders get get uh, thrown out of the room in Singapore, I'd like to come back to you all to just give a quick 20, 20 seconds. To what where would you like us to be um, in a year's time at understanding? Room? So, if you you know twenty seconds, uh, where would you like us to be? I mean, Rowan, if I can come to you first for your twenty seconds. Yeah, so Mark kind of came up with the phrase, uh, every financial decision should take uh, uh, climate into account. Uh, I think we really sense that uh, physical climate risk and natural uh, related natural hazard risk can now be integrated into mainstream financial decision making. And that means by this time next year, that the primary financial regulators around the world, the central banks and others have been plugged in to the UR community uh, particularly via uh, the Global Resilience Index and related initiatives to really make that that fusion that we've dreamt of for probably a decade uh, happen at this uh, you know magical moment we have in the next 12 months to make it happen. Thank you, Rowan. Um, over to you, Gila. Yeah, I think what I'd like to see in a year is that whenever there is a decision to be made, one should be able to look at your index or other information and before putting money in, look at what impact it's going to have on the climate, how resilient it is, and then make an informed decision. And all that expertise uh, should come in very standardized forms so that one doesn't have to learn 20 different kinds of disclosures and that one is just able to, you know, look at things in a standardized manner and make uh, certain financial decisions based on that. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent point. Uh, Kelvin. Thanks. Uh, I'm greedy. I actually have two, uh, but uh, the, the last speaker actually saw one of them, but that's fine. I would love to see a consolidation of the emerging standards. I think there are too many at this point. It's confusing. Uh, I would like to also see Lighthouse, uh, sort of iconic uh, nature-based uh, financing uh, projects, uh, funding by biodiversity. Um, that's probably not going to happen in a year, but you can keep on dreaming. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Anders? Less focus on what financial institutions think they will have achieved by 2050 and more focus on what did they actually achieve in the last year. 
That's an excellent point. And then over to you, Benedict. Thanks. Um, well, it's not going to happen in a year, but what I would like to see is that we look at all public services, public service delivery, whether directed by the government or by state or companies, by private sector, and consider them to be shock responsive. That we deal with disaster interruptions as a form of maintenance. Call it extreme maintenance, but it's built in, it can respond, life goes on, so services continue to go back. Thank you. And then the last word to you, Connor, to wrap us uh, up. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I hope actually that we're not talking about climate risk anymore. Um, I really hope that actually it's so well embedded with how we think about risk that it's just part of the discussion. It's not something that needs to be flagged as being a separate uh, piece of uh, conversation around risk. Thank you. I think that's that's the perfect end point. So thank you all so much. And thank you very much to our audience as well online and in person for, for listening. But yeah, thank you so much for your for your wonderful insights today and look forward to seeing you again soon.